Amen. Romans chapters 5 and 6, chapter 5 deals with the death of Christ. It deals with different aspects of how important and how significant the death of Jesus Christ is. Chapter 6 deals with how we access and benefit from the death of Christ. How we're baptized into His death and that we are then free from sin to live an obedient life. So Romans chapter 5 and 6, talking about the death of Christ and how important it is, and how we should, chapter 6, respond to that with a faith that's obedient to the will of God. So Romans chapter 5, he's basically summarizing what he talked about in chapter 4, the concept of we are, being, we are justified by Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, and not by works. The type of works he was talking about there in chapter 4 are works whereby a person can boast, whereby a person can earn their salvation, whereby a person can get themselves to heaven based on their own value in the sense of being good enough to go. And he gave the example of one person under the patriarchy, Abraham. He was counted forgiveness or counted righteous and forgiven under the patriarchy without the law of Moses. Then you had David who talked about being, having mercy under the law of Moses. And then he concludes uh, with the fact that uh, we are like Abraham in the sense of we walk in the steps of Abraham to do his will and God accounts us as righteous. We are viewed by God as righteous in the sight of uh, God through Jesus Christ. And that is because of Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 5, Paul is going to go into more detail concerning the different aspects of the death of Jesus and how significant it is to us as Christians. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who He has given to us. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 here, dealing with the fact, therefore... In verse 1, he's summarizing the fact that we are justified by Jesus Christ and we've been justified by faith. That is the faith that we have revealed in the gospel. Remember Romans 1 and verse 16, the gospel is God's power to save. So we are justified by faith, not by the works of the law of Moses, Not by the law of Moses, but by faith. And this faith, of course, is a comprehensive term that denotes everything we do in response to God's will. Believing in Christ, confessing Him, repenting of our sins, being baptized, and living the Christian life. Being faithful in the death, Revelation 2 and verse 10. So it's a comprehensive word that denotes the whole of our response to what God has done. We're justified by faith. That word justified means to be pronounced not guilty. Not guilty. And as a result, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. He would be known as Jesus. He would be known as the Prince of Peace, the one who would bring peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is a calm 
resolve a person has in the midst of conflict. See, we have, as we live the Christian life, peace with God, even though around us is conflict conflict and difficulty, trouble and things around us. We have peace with God, but we were the ones who were at odds with God. And as we're going to see throughout this chapter, it is we who left God and God provided a way back. We are the ones who left God in our sin. But it is God who provided a way back so that we could once again uh, be in fellowship with Him and have uh, our life together with Him. Now this phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ is found in, in verse 1. It's also found in verse 11. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It's also found in verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ, found in verse 1, found in verse 11, found in verse 21. Denoting that Jesus is the central theme of the scheme of redemption. And He is to be our Lord Jesus Christ. That means we have to submit to Him as Lord. In Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 30. Six, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both what? Lord and Christ. Master and Messiah. He is to be our master, our supreme leader, our king. And when people want Jesus as Savior and they don't want Him as Lord... They're not going to get the salvation they think they have or they feel that they have. So many people want a Savior, but they don't want a Lord. They want Jesus to save them. But they're not going to give up the things of this world. They're not going to give up their worldliness. They're not going to repent. They're not going to change their ways. They're not going to alter anything. They, they want to be saved in their sin all the way up into the time they die. And that's just not the case. Jesus has to be Lord and Savior. And so we are to do His will. In Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So we have to do what He says. We have to obey His will. And that's the emphasis. He is our Lord, Jesus Christ. Emphasized in verse 1, verse 11, and in verse 21. So it does not work when people say, Oh, Jesus, Jesus is my Savior. They even might say, Jesus is Lord. But if they're not living it, then He is not Lord of their life and they will not benefit from His sacrifice. You look at verse 2 there, uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So this peace that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ by faith, also by faith we have access into the grace of God. Into this grace. Now, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, he's going to give more details as to how we got into or how we accessed this grace. We're baptized into his death. We're baptized into Christ. And we're raised to walk in newness of life. And that's how, at what point in our faith that happened. He's going to talk about that in Romans chapter 6. But he's giving a broad general statement here. It's by faith. Now, when people take these verses, uh, they, they, in their minds, because of their theological training and because what Pastor so-and-so said, they always put the word alone or only with faith. They think that means only. 
Faith alone or faith only, which means you don't have to do anything else. Well, of course, the Bible is very clear about uh, the danger of uh, adding to God's word and saying something God has not said. Faith only is only found one time in the Bible, James 2 and verse 24, where the Holy Spirit says we're justified by works and not by faith only or faith alone, depending on the translation you might have. So it is by faith we have access into the grace of God. That word into, that's that same word in Greek, the preposition that denotes being baptized into Christ. Being baptized into this relationship. So he is, because he's not mentioning baptism here in verse 1 and 2, certainly doesn't mean he's excluding it. He's going to be talking about it in the same book. He's just giving a broad statement. We are justified by faith. That's exactly true. There's more details to that. That's a broad statement that is, uh, that is explained in more detail throughout the rest of the New Testament. So we have access by faith into this grace. It's the grace that God made available. Remember, Grace is the basis of our salvation in Christ, not works. If works were the basis of our salvation, we wouldn't need grace. We could save ourselves. We wouldn't need a Savior. It is grace that is the basis of our salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Our faith works righteousness Our faith works through love, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. That proves we have a living faith, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, and Hebrews chapter 11, the whole chapter. That proves that we have a genuine, real, living faith when we keep His commandments and do the things that He has told us to do. So we stand in this faith. This is what places us into Christ. This is what places us into the position in which we can pray for forgiveness. You see, what people don't understand when it comes to praying for forgiveness, that is not the privilege of someone who's outside of Christ. That's the privilege of someone who's already in Christ. Someone who's already a child of God. So that's why it's impossible for a sinner to pray for salvation who's never obeyed the gospel. That's one of many reasons. Those who rest their salvation based upon the sinner's prayer, and they say, well, we can pray to God for forgiveness. Yes, if you're a child of God already, but not if you're someone who's not even obeyed the gospel. You you don't have access into the grace of God. You've never been put into Christ to begin with. So... Uh, that prayer there of, uh, in faith in the grace of God is where we receive the forgiveness of sins as a child of God. Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. Simon was told to repent and pray to God that his wickedness would be forgiven. This was a man who'd already been baptized. And it says, this is where we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hope is earnest expectation that something is going to happen, that we are going to reach a destination. It is not the way we use the word hope in the sense of I hope to do something and, and it's just kind of a, you know, perhaps it'll happen. It's no perhaps. We, uh, if we remain faithful and we take our stand and we remain in the grace of God, our hope of the glory of God will be fulfilled. No, perhaps it will. If we remain faithful, it will be. And I think if brethren would understand that and understand better the grace of God, they, there would be a, a less doubting of their salvation. And I think some of that has to do with maturing in Christ and, 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 and knowing more about the grace of God. Uh, But there's a lot of Christians who don't know whether they're saved or not. And it might be because they're not living as they should. They're lukewarm at best. That could be a factor to, to put into the equation. 
But we can't sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, unless we mean it. And if we sing that and we don't mean it, then there's something amiss in our life. We are either taking our stand in the grace of God or not. And it will rob your joy. That's why he says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. If you don't know whether you're saved from one day to the next, then how are you going to rejoice? How are you going to rejoice? We rejoice in the hope of God. Rejoice means to joy again. Keep on having joy. Joy again. The Bible tells us that we are to be people that are full of rejoicing. We are to be people that are uh, uh, full of, of joy. Philippians 3 and verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He talks about rejoicing. Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We are to be the most optimistic people. We're realistic, but we're optimistic at the same time. We're realistic. We, we, we are not blind to our surroundings as far as what's going on. But we are optimistic. You know, sometimes that's not... That's not an easy thing. That's not an easy thing. It could be because of experiences in our life. It could be because of how we were raised. Circumstances we're currently going through. It's hard to rejoice sometimes. But we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All this goes back to the glory of God. We were created for the purpose of glorifying God. Isaiah 43 and verse 7. That's why we exist as human beings, to glorify God, to bring Him honor and glory. And we will share in that glory in the sense when God exalts us and, uh, in the resurrection from the dead, and we have been found faithful on that day of judgment, we will enter into the glory of the Lord. We will enter into the heavenly realm to be with God, and we will rejoice forevermore. Any questions or comments about the first two verses before we go any further? There is just so much in Romans chapter 5. Each verse is just full of tremendous amount of lessons. Verse 3, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. We have tribulation in the world. I think it's John 16, 33, where Jesus speaks of tribulation. Yes, John 16, 30, 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, that's being realistic and optimistic at the same time. Realistic, we're going to have tr- trouble, we're going to have difficulty. Sometimes it's our own fault, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's because we're a Christian. Sometimes it's because we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. We're going to have difficulty, we're going to have tribulation. But Christ has overcome the world. And if we remain faithful to Him, we can overcome too. So back to Romans 5 and verse 3. But we also glory in tribulations. Why? Why? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. It helps make us what? Stronger. It helps make us stronger. What doesn't kill us will make us stronger. Now, whatever kills us will be in a better place as faithful Christians. But if we remain here on the earth, it'll make us stronger in Christ. So that's perseverance. The tribulations, the difficulties, the the problems that we face, that's just part of being a a Christian. Revelation chapter 1, John spoke about that. Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 9 
I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was exiled in very bad conditions on the isle of Patmos in tribulation in the kingdom. So this is what you face in the world. This is what we have to go through in the world. But that produces perseverance. It helps to refine us. What does it take to get a diamond? A tremendous amount of pressure. Heat over thousands of years, not millions. Over thousands of years. In fact, they can make diamonds in the, in the laboratory. It, it's not very cost effective to do so. So that's why they don't mass produce them. But it doesn't take millions of years to make diamonds. That's a side note. But the point is, thousands of years, pressure, time, pressure, heat. Then you have a diamond. You have a diamond. What does it take to make a pearl? Isn't it like a little bit of a grit, sand that gets into the, the oysters uh, inside and it, the mucus is covering it to, to deal with the irritation? Then, then that grows into a, a pearl. Time, irritation, difficulty. So these things that we go through, uh, because we're Christians or because we are dealing uh, with uh, a world that is contrary to God's will, and is full of bad things, helps to produce in us perseverance. That's the attitude of sticking with it. Persevering helps us to grow. And perseverance, verse 4, character. What, what would be a good definition of character? Qualities, that's a good, I guess you would call synonym. Qualities. Hmm? The manner of your person. The uh, part of who we are, it, 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 it is who we are at our core. The kind of person we are. The character that we are and what what we go through for living the Christian life helps to form in us Christ. Christ. So the character uh, that the perseverance um, produces, produces the character of Christ in us. So we, we see that this suffering is very important. And Jesus went through this. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. This is talking about when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when God said to His own Son, No, you have to go to the cross. Who in the days of His flesh, Hebrews 5 and verse 7, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Perseverance. Character. And being perfected, he's become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So Christ went through this. And he proved himself to be the character, having the qualities of wanting to serve God and to put Him absolutely first, to do the Father's will no matter what. He had to have that attitude in place that we are to have as well. Not my will, but your will be done. I don't want to go through this, but I know if it's your will, I will go through this. The denial of oneself. So this perseverance, because of the tribulation, produces character. Why is it that the 
generation that came up through World War II. It's called the greatest generation. Because of the character of people, the hardworking people, the, 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 the furnace of refining fires they went through during World War II produced some of the greatest quality people that our society has ever seen. It just builds character. If you allow those things to, to mold you and shape you in a, in a righteous direction. Then, verse 4, Romans chapter 5 and verse 4, character, hope. Hope. Now, this hope is an earnest expectation that God will come through on the promises He's made. Verse 5, now, hope does not disappoint. We're not going to live this Christian life to the best of our ability, endure what we endure, build the character of Christ in us, and then be lost in hell. Because the, the love of God doesn't disappoint. He will be with us and He will carry us through no matter what we're facing. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we see here we have this relationship with God and as we're living this relationship with God, we have... Uh, the love of God poured out into our hearts. The concept of it's just being poured there. God's pouring out His love on His children that are faithful to Him by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when was the Holy Spirit given to Christians? When did that happen? At baptism. You have a passage for that? Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 38. I know many good brethren who have differed on the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've studied it for years and will continue to study it. But I've concluded that this is referring to simply what it says, the gift of the Spirit given to us. Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And it's been called the non-miraculous uh, gift of the Holy Spirit that every person gets at baptism. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. Peter here speaking. The apostles are on trial. Verse 32, And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. So those who obey Him, they obey Him in baptism. The Holy Spirit is given to them by God. And so we have this promise based upon the, the passages of Scripture. The Bible makes it very clear that uh, we are indeed the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Talking about fleeing fornication, stay away from harlots and those women and men who are of that nature it says in verse 16 do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two he says shall become one flesh but he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him flee sexual immorality every sin that a man does is outside the body but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So th these and many other passages make it very clear that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And as I try to emphasize, because of, there's so 
much misunderstanding in our world about the Holy Spirit, even among brethren. I would not know this happened except the Bible tells me. There's no feeling. There's no tingling. There is nothing in, in our physical makeup, our five senses, that would indicate that this had happened at our baptism except the Bible tells us. We have to accept it by faith. And so this is by uh, faith, as it says in verse 1 and verse 2, that all of this takes place. And as we live in harmony with the words of the Holy Spirit found in the Bible, the Holy Spirit's in us, the Father is in us, the Son is in us, and we are the temple of the Spirit. Any questions or comments about that before we go any further? Verses 6 through 11 is going to go into the, the main purpose of why he's writing in this section. And that is to talk about the death of Christ and how significant it is and how, how vital it is to our salvation. Without it, there would be no salvation. Verse 6, for when we we were still without strength in due time, uh, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It says here in verse 6, When we were without strength, Christ died for us. The point of being without strength is helpless. Completely helpless. Completely unable to get ourselves out of the problem of sin that we put ourselves in. Completely unable to do so. Without someone rescuing us, saving us, bringing about a a means by which we could be saved, we were hellbound. The best of us, you you get the best person that's done the most works. If he ever sinned, he's hellbound. He's hellbound because of the nature of God. God being completely holy, completely just, and cannot have anything to do with sin and rebellion without without a Savior, we were without strength. We don't have the strength to save ourselves. That doesn't mean we did not have the ability to obey God's will. I'm not saying that, and that's where that's where denominational people go to an extreme and say, see, you can't do anything. You're without strength. You just call on Him and He'll save you. No, that's not what this is saying. That's saying we can't save ourselves. Our faith must comply with God's will to receive the salvation we could not have because we're without strength. There's no way we could be saved through our own scheme, or our own plan, our own agenda. While we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for us. Just at the right time, Christ came in history. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And again, verse 6 talks about the Holy Spirit being given to us. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. It goes along with Acts 2 and verse 38, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 5 and verse 32. 
So we were helpless. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You've got to recognize that. If you don't recognize your spiritual poverty, the fact that you're without strength, and you cannot save yourself except through Jesus Christ and His will, uh, then you can't be saved. You've got to come to terms with your condition. But in the, in, in the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now this is significant because he's going to go through a couple of scenarios. Some might die for a good man. Uh, some might uh, die for a righteous man. If we think someone's worthy of saving, uh, we, we, would, we would be very diligent uh, to save that individual. And, and think that if we do that, that this, uh, of course, would help them to continue their life and to do good. There are some people who aren't worth saving in, in our estimation, in our opinion of things and how we see things in the sense of physical saving. There's no way I'm going to try to put a stop to the execution of the Fort Hood terrorist. He's on death row. He's upset because they made him shave his beard. I'm not going to lose any sleep over that either. But there's no way I'm going to try to save him from his execution. I pray that he comes to Christ. That's his only hope. But I'm not going to try to save him because he's worthy of death. The point is, Christ didn't come into the world because we were so wonderful and good and pious to save wonderful and good, pious people. He came to save people like the Fort Hood terrorist. Ungodly people. He came into the world to save sinners like me and like you and rapists and murderers and homosexuals. He came to die for them. Verse 7, scarcely, you know, barely, for a righteous man one would die. Perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now here's how we have to see things from God's viewpoint. See how He sees sin. You're just as much a sinner if you tell one lie as the person who goes out and rapes children. Now, we don't look at it that way. The liar who told one lie, and that's the only sin they committed, is just as lost as the person who goes out here and does horrible acts to children and then kills them. Just as lost. We think, surely, one little lie, really? They're going to go to hell for that lie? All liars. Revelation 21, was it real? Verse 8, Revelation 21, 8. All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. And I think he put all liars in there to get us to understand even those small little sins that we think are insignificant will get you to hell just as much as the big, monstrous sins. We were all in the sinner boat, so to speak, heading over the falls into the lake of fire. All of us. Every accountable person. But God demonstrated His own love toward me, toward you, toward us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ came to die to rescue us from that sinful condition. Not because we were already good enough, and God says, well, they're good enough for my son to die for. No. 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 We were all contaminated with sin when we sinned against God. And thus cut off from God. Alienated from God. And in verse 9, much more then, having now been justified by His blood. This is our condition in the grace of God. Remember verse 2, by faith we have been uh, granted access 
into this grace. This is where we stand, in the grace of God. Baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6 gives the details of that. Now, we're justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. You see, we deserve the wrath of God. We deserve that. You know, when I read and I study and sometimes when I preach on hell, it is a sobering thing to consider. That's where I deserve to go. And so do you. That's where I would be going with, if it were not for Christ. Because of our sins. So through the blood of Christ, we're saved from wrath through Him. In verse 10. And if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son... How much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Verse 10 talks about being enemies uh, of God. You know, I think it's in James chapter 4, he talks about the Holy Spirit has James write that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Being worldly is being an enemy of God. And you see... It only takes one sin for that to be accomplished. Adam and Eve sinned. They became enemies of God at that point. Hostile toward God. Enemies of God. And you see, we walked away from God. This is the concept of us being reconciled to God. There's nowhere in the Bible, I read this today from one of the commentators, and I believe it to be true. I haven't found it myself. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says God is reconciled to us. We are reconciled to God because we left God. God is where He's always been in holiness and righteousness. We became contaminated with sin when we sinned and violated God's will. Just like Adam and Eve, they left God when they ate the forbidden fruit. God didn't leave them. They left God. But through Christ, when we were enemies, we can be reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Now, reconcile. What does that mean? What's it mean to be reconciled? Brought back to. You have a husband and a wife that are at odds with one another. Let's see. Jennifer and I are at odds with with each other. Jennifer's wrong about something. I'm right. That's usually how it goes. And we're at odds with one another. And Robert steps in and says, let's get together, let's talk about this, and reconciles us both together, brings us back, and heals that relationship. You can think of the word reconnect, to be reconnected with God. We disconnected from God by our sins. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, our sins separate us from God. Yes? Exactly. There has to be, we, we have to come into the agreement with God's will. That's what a covenant is. God gives the terms. We agree with it. We abide by it. And we're saved. We're reconciled. He gives the terms of the agreement and we have to simply believe and obey it. We don't have any right to modify it or change it. So we're reconciled uh, to God through the death of His Son. And we shall be saved by His life. Verse 10 is talking about His life now. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is in heaven as our mediator. Jesus is the one before the Father through whom we pray. So through His life, we're saved. In verse 11, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received The reconciliation. We'll have more to say about that in our devotional period. So I'll be reading and studying the rest of Romans chapter 5 for next week. And perhaps we'll get into Romans 6 next week. Lord willing.